let's get going. So thank you to Ananda for doing some QA on the meeting this evening. And I've lost my tiling again, so let's just go back to tiled. I'm not going to be able to see you all tonight. That's okay. We'll just have to accept that and keep going. So some just some housekeeping things up front first off. Uh, please mute your microphones now if you haven't already. We are recording and hosting the meeting on YouTube. So I'd like you to put any questions into the chat. Please be patient if you put stuff into the chat because I'm having trouble seeing it tonight. It's going to be one of those nights. Um, question time is officially at the end, but if you've got a question that you want to ask, I will try and ask them. Um, we'll try and answer them during the session when I see them. And if you need to go, you can get straight back in any time that you want. So can everybody hear me okay tonight? Great. Okay, I saw a couple of nods. I'll just try and get tiling working again one last time. Let's just flip back to spotlight and then flip back to tiled and we'll see what happens. No, that's okay. All right. So our program for today, I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, so far, we've got 31 people in here which is pretty cool. There's a, a lot of familiar names in here. I would love it if everybody could put their name into the chat, please, because then I actually know who everybody is during the recap. We have got a special guest tonight who I've been keeping a bit of a secret. So you'll all find out who that is very shortly. I did see them join a couple of moments ago, so I'm very happy to see that they're in here. If anybody would like to be a guest on a future episode, I guess that's what these have become then uh, feel free to let me know. So after, we'll hear from our special guest first up, and then after that, we'll be talking about lenses. And by popular demand, we'll be talking about macro. I wasn't going to uh, spend much time on macro for local guides, because it doesn't make that much sense for maps things, but a lot of people asked for it, so in it goes. And we'll also talk a little bit about leading lines later on as our composition thing and then we'll get into our tasks. Now, I've shared two links into the chat already. One is the photo album for tonight, and the other one is for a feedback for tonight. And if you wouldn't mind filling out feedback, I certainly appreciate it. It really helps me to design what the next episodes of our workshops will be to make sure they're useful for you guys. Last week, we had a task, which was about rule of thirds. and there was one image that really struck me. Lots of them were awesome, but there's one image I looked at it and I just thought, wow. And I, I noticed Stuart come in before, so I hope you can see this. Um, Stuart, do you want to unmute and tell us a little bit about this image? Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I took this image, I took this photo last year when we were on holiday in Greece on a deserted beach with my wife and family. I had my Sony mirrorless camera with me and I got a little bit bored, you know, it was a bit hot under the sun, decided to take some pictures of this beautiful ocean. I thought, well, what can you do with the what can you do with the ocean? So I, I lay down on my stomach, waited for these huge waves to come towards me, which they did every few seconds, put it on a very, very fast shutter speed and clicked away and then took about a hundred. And this one this one was the best one. And I hear you paid a little bit of a penalty for this too. I got a few splashes on the lens, yeah. Uh, no permanent damage, but um, okay. <laughs> I had to be really quick. I had to take the picture, to click, and then jump back or, or slide back as, as quickly as I uh, as I could, or put the camera in the air to avoid the the splash bar. But yeah, I was pretty pleased with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a really cool image. It's quite striking, and it um, exhibits rule Thanks. of third perfectly. Who wants to know who our special guest is? It's not much point waving your hands today because I can only see three of you for whatever reason. I hope they're still in here. Let me just check in the list of names. Yes. Actually, there's a clue. The person's here twice. So a special guest is Vandana, an absolutely awesome 
an inspirational person who I've had the privilege of meeting a couple of times in person now. Uh, I won't introduce too much about her beyond being a solo traveler, because I know she is absolutely awesome at telling people about herself and her travels and what photography means to her. So I'm going to stop presenting and I'm going to hand over to her now. So welcome, Vandana. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Super excited to be here. And uh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone in the chat. <laughs> so nice to see you all. And thank you for having me uh, here. And uh, I just wanted to mention about that photograph of uh, my steward. It's so beautiful. And it's so very unique, too. People always think in terms of, you know, the rule of thirds in terms of like a uh, landscape. But this is uh, a very different kind where uh, he divided it into uh, thirds this way, like horizontal, sort of like the vertical grids. It's a great one there. So uh, for those of you who do not know, I'm Vandana from Bangalore. And uh, I've been a local guide for, I think, about uh, close to three years this July, I think. And uh, as Paul mentioned, I love solo traveling. I enjoy it the most. And uh, Paul requested me last uh, last week, I think, and asked if you would like to be faster. I said, yes, definitely would love to share a couple of uh, things related to travel and uh, solo traveling and photography. So I, I do have a couple of photos that I want to share. I've kept this very, very fluid, really not going to follow a particular order. I let this picture speak for itself and kind of narrate a story around it. And towards the end, I'll just share a couple of uh, tips that I have. So, uh, Paul, may I present? Um... I was muted. Certainly. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. I've pinned your presentation, so hopefully everybody can see it. Yeah. Okay, so I have mentioned it as solo travel plus photography because uh, I'm by no means uh, any professional photographer. I'm just getting into that. And I love both of these activities. I love traveling and photography, and I find it extremely challenging to combine uh, both of them and make the best out of it because, uh, you know, it's too much of a divided attention. Uh, when it comes to photography, I'd like to be completely involved in whatever little concepts I know, I'd like to implement that. And at the same time, when I'm traveling too, I, I'm running out of time and want to make the most of it by actually being present rather than just keep clicking and spending time. So I've, I've just not found the balance of, uh, you know, combining both of them, not found the art of doing it. Perhaps I have to travel more. I have to perhaps travel longer and stay at the same place for a longer time. But uh, yeah, travel cost, uh, it's difficult to balance both of them. So um, I'll just try dive straight to these photography uh, photographs. The first one is, you know, I love to, as I mentioned, travel and uh, I'm a nature lover. Green mountains, beautiful forests. These are something I just love to capture. And uh, I started, I think, my first travel, uh, getting the feel of the nature when I did my uh, Himalayan treks with a local uh, company. And this is taken from a particular uh, trek called uh, Rupin Pass. That's R-U-P-I-N, Rupin Pass in the uh, Himalayas. And uh, I was walking by and, you know, I was uh, trailing behind, actually. Uh, we had completed the pass. So it starts from one particular state, Uttarakhand, and it goes to another state, uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh. So it's not like a circular trek. And I love non-circular treks because you don't have to come back to the same place. So this is, we had finished the Rupin Pass. So the pass is, you know, connecting uh, a passage between two mountains. So we finished the pass and then we were going down. We were uh, descending. And uh, I just saw, looked up and I saw this beautiful uh, frame image. And I was like, God, I had to capture it. So I think I, I, I had a point and shoot camera uh, that time. And I clicked that, uh, I think it was a Kodak camera. I had to look at the EXIF uh, information. 
but uh, yeah, I just captured it, and uh, this just brings me really good memories uh, there. So the thing is, still, I think once in a while, just kind of look up, and especially when you're trekking uh, and you kind of get uh, too bogged down, just look up and see, and try your best to capture that image. Um, next one is, you know, this this I haven't clicked this photo. Somebody else clicked this of me. A challenge that a lot of solo photographers, solo travelers uh, face is getting a photo of yourself clicked. It's like one of the huge just challenges, I would say, because you travel to such beautiful places. And uh, as a nature lover, this this was from my first uh, solo trip, uh, Norway, and the place is uh, Trondheim. Uh, please correct me if my pronunciation is uh, incorrect. And it's a beautiful uh, western region of uh, Norway. You have beautiful fjords there too. And uh, I actually uh, went cycling. So I was staying at this Airbnb guest uh, place and uh, he let me rent a cycle for free, which is sometimes usually charged. So I took his cycle and, uh, you know, had to clean the entire thing. And uh, I just went cycling and just put some, uh, just followed Google Maps and I just thought, okay, uh, let me follow the uh, coastal route. And I came across this beautiful pier and uh, such a beautiful scenery. I took a couple of photos, but I wanted to be in it too. And uh, how many selfies can you really take? You know, you just get uh, bored. And then I found that there was uh, another person uh, walking by and I made sure to like, please, can you click a photo? And uh, I got this uh, photograph clicked and I really like it because I think it follows, follows the rule of thirds and there's a, like, the entire scenery is there and including myself and with selfies the challenge is like your face is like right there in the middle and uh, even though you, you take with a selfie stick then uh, you know the time might uh, you might miss the shot and it might take too much time to like fix everything and then click so uh, and especially while riding the cycle, it's too much of, uh, you're, you're juggling too much. So it's always just, I, I use a, I don't use a selfie stick. So I'm, I was very pleased with this uh, photograph that came. Uh, next one is, I would say, try to, uh, you know, experiment uh, when you're taking uh, photographs. Many of you take landscape photographs, right? Like when you're in a landscape, you want to try and always take it in a landscape mode. But sometimes when you have fun, when you try to experiment, you get some really nice shots. I thought this orientation was very good because that's right, Paul, because uh, I wanted to get the dramatic style, which is something I'm a huge fan of. And uh, this was on the way to one of the famous uh, trekking spots or hiking spots in Norway it's, uh, called Alpit Rock. And the day that I went there was, you know, this was the weather. You had to, um, I took a ferry. So there was like a boat ride and then uh, they would drop you off at this place. You go hike and come back and uh, the bus will uh, drop you to another ferry point and you come back. So when I reached this point, it was like raining and pouring and uh, it was just so unfortunate because the pictures that you see of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Google images, the picture that you have in mind when you start hiking is completely different, you know. So you have to be prepared for all kinds of uh, weather uh, possibilities. But nevertheless, at one point, it just it just stopped raining and there was a little bit of clouds moving away and the sun was slightly about to shine. So I had to like juggle and get the camera out and uh, I, I took this uh, okay, from my mobile and I took this photograph. So I thought the orientation mm -hmm. made sense for this because the sky as well as the road, uh, the path I wanted to get. Next, again, a similar uh, uh, portrait mode because I wanted to ca capture the uh, sky as well as the fjord. Uh, this was taken uh, at a place called uh, Flom. And uh, I think this is uh, Orlands Fjorden. And it's a fjord that, uh, you know, it's again on the western, uh, uh, sorry, Flam is actually in the uh, slightly close to the midpoint, middle of Austria. But you have beautiful fjords that come in. And the water was just so beautiful. We were on our way back. And uh, 
the um, sightseeing guy just stopped us and stopped the car and uh, we could just go out and take a photo and i was so glad that i could uh, capture this and uh, this another one try and experiment you know try and get a panorama this is something that i really like again fan of amazing skies and mountains were there can anyone guess the location of this place yes i already see a couple of um, chats uh, i don't know that i forgot the person's name but yes you are right this is taken at our beautiful uh, dharamshala it's the um, himachal pradesh uh, cricket stadium it is um, one of the most i think it's the world's highest uh, cricket stadium in terms of the height at which it's located and i would also say it's one of the most beautiful uh, cricket stadiums in the world it's absolutely it's a beautiful sight you have to witness it and uh, i have taken a couple of 360 photographs to thanks to the google camera and uh, i uploaded at this place and i really like this uh, picture again it was really cloudy you have those dramatic skies and uh, to be really nice to watch a match here i think at the most uh, 20 20 because uh, 50 overs or test cricket is not my thing this is uh, another uh, photograph that i really like this was from the third hike that i went third himalayan hike it's on the way uh, it was the hamta pass the trekking route the car just dropped us at one point and you know we had to hike ahead so it was really beautiful the pine forest and you know you kind of uh, going into the forest in this beautiful road ahead with lots of greenery around the contrast was really nice and uh, i took this a couple of hikers too so adding the human element in the in the nature it's really nice it kind of also shows how really insignificant we are when we come when we come across such beautiful uh, uh, grandeur um this is another photo somebody clicked you know because as a traveler you want to have some memories you want to be in it too and sometimes you have an eye a good photographer try to capture everything uh, in the same frame this was from the chadar trek it's uh, located in uh, leh the highest uh, one of the highest uh, i mean the north indian uh, uh, region in uh, jammu kashmir now uh, of course it's it's leh and um, there is a lake it's called the zanskar lake and it freezes during winter and in uh, olden days when the lake froze by walking was the only mode of transport to cross villages so people had to wait to cross you know wait till winters for the lake to freeze there were no roads and nothing so when we went on the trek our guide was telling us about this uh, about the tip, i mean the way people uh, live here and we could see you know a couple of localites just uh, having a sledge pack something and you know they were actually uh, walking they were what they wanted to leave the state so many people from lay actually during winters they leave their home place and they go across to different uh, states to uh, sell their uh, you know goods i think one thing that i remember was many of them come to goa because it's it's always warm and uh, nice and pleasant so they spend the winters in goa and then they go back uh, to their hometown and i really like this uh, image and uh, this was the first time i experienced sub zero temperature like really minus 10 uh, i would say um, we were trekking during minus 10 degrees uh, you can see from the clothing that we were wearing and i think i remember i spent uh, minus 35 degrees in the night in a tent it was so freezing i cannot i think my mind uh, my brain froze because i was wearing multiple gears and uh, multiple uh, sleeping bags too and uh, this was uh, it was just too much it was just too much this is uh, the next one this is another image that i just love the most it is uh, taken from the zanskar lake uh, excuse me one second
this is uh, from the zanskar like it's the confluence of the confluence of two lakes uh nim uh, it's a place called nimu it's indus and zanskar confluence so i i really like this uh, uh image and another one i want to show is uh, it's like a comparison of uh, two image this was taken at the zion or the zion national park in utah uh this was taken last year when i uh, uh when i was there and i really like this image i really want to be a part of this image and you know i i click this and then now uh, when i try to uh, click myself in this picture this is what happened so you can really say that uh, these are the uh, things that uh, you know happens like uh, one of the challenges you would face you you see a picture and you want to be a part of it and this is what uh, happens you won't uh, end up being you won't get the right scenery and others i would say is that sometimes you know just go ahead and have fun even though there's going to be a lot of selfies in it try and uh, make sure that uh you try the best to have fun you can master the art of selfie uh in it and uh, so yeah keeping with in terms of uh, tips while you are a solo traveler what is it that you can do is uh, you know to try and get good photographs keep an eye out for photographers right uh when you know that they have a nice dslr camera and they are shooting you would know that they would get they would be able to take good photos if you you would have nice memories with it or sometimes you don't have anybody around show and tell so you click the picture and you show them that you know this is the kind of photo that i want and uh, give them an image or give them instructions of how you want to be framed and then they will uh, come and and then they will be able to uh, take the picture and last but not the least you know try these three trips like you know try for remote timer there are i mean the advantages of this is yes you'll get a really good shot but sometimes the moment might just pass away you know by the time you arrange all of these things and you want to take a nice uh, you know with a dramatic sky or you and by the time you arrange everything a cloud might just come and just cover the entire scenery so there are challenges when it comes to uh, solo traveling plus photography but you have these uh, uh gears to patience and perseverance uh, just makes it all worthwhile like how stuart mentioned he like was laying on the ground waiting for the waves to come sometimes you just have to stand there forget the people all around looking at you and then now uh, uh, click the photograph to the help of a timer and yeah last but not least make sure you try to have as much fun be as spontaneous as possible even though you're taking the selfie sometimes you get the most natural expressions uh, uh when again when it comes to people photography try and uh, be as candid as possible <laughs> this is taken from uh, connect live 2018 calls uh, photo walk that was the first time first photo walks that i've uh, i i got a chance to attend so yeah this is it has really i have really fond memories of uh, this photo and yeah that that's it uh, i haven't gone through all the chat so in case anybody has any questions or want call you have anything to say you can please unmute that was absolutely awesome vandana and i i, I love the uh, selfie at the end with the group i remember when you took that one it was very spontaneous and uh, you can see <laughs> quite a few people haven't even had a chance to react yet they're just starting yeah. to go hey what's going on yeah <laughs> I'm quite envious of some of the places you've been. They're uh, very cool. Thank you. So, thank you for coming along and being our guest tonight. I'll just start the presentation again. So, absolutely awesome to have you here. Um, a few people have joined us since we started. I'm just running over my headphone cord which isn't good a few people have joined us since we started so we're just coming on and recording all of these things for youtube so if you don't want to be recorded uh, please mute your mic and kill your video feed and then we won't be able to see you anyway i'd like everybody to unmute and give a quick round of applause for vandana for coming along and making this effort to tell us about her travel <laughs> Thank you.
and if anybody would like to be a guest on a future episode, you'd be absolutely more than welcome to do so. Just uh, DM me in the various places that you can find me. Connect's probably the best place. And we'll go on with our workshop this evening. So our main topic today is about lenses. And you can probably see, sort of, I move the camera a little bit. I've got a whole bunch of them over there. Um, that's part of my collection of lenses. They're the ones I probably use the most because they suit the camera that I use the most. I better just uh, put this on the right way around. There's one thing that uh, never ceases to amuse me. People get these lovely little things which they're to help you control the light and stop flaring in your photography. And how many times do you see someone with it on the wrong way around like mine was just before? It's kind of funny. So I'll just move on. So there's often a sense that you need to have professional lenses. And I'm going to talk that through because sometimes it's true, but it's not always true. And there's certainly no reason to not use consumer lenses. So some of the best lenses that you can buy actually are quite cheap consumer lenses. Now, in the differences between the two, two of them, professional lenses, usually all of the lens optics are made of glass, whereas the consumer ones, they're often plastic. Not always, but often. Uh, that means that the glass ones are usually a better quality because they're ground to a higher standard. Professional lenses are usually the full length of the lens. So if it says it's 45 millimeters, then it really is 45 millimeters from where the focal point in the camera is up to where the optics end. The consumer ones often use tricks of bouncing light around inside them. Um, I've got one lens which is an 800 millimeter lens but it's only about that long so it's bouncing the light around on mirrors to achieve that most consumer ones are usually metal bodied and they're fairly robust so i've had mine for quite a few years and the previous brand of camera i, I had before that i had them for quite a few years as well uh, they tend to last quite a while even if you're a bit rough with them or if you drop them it's not something you want to do but if you do uh, the consumer ones are usually plastic and quite often they're not very strong. A lot of consumer lenses won't survive one drop, whereas the professional ones tend to. And if you're anything like me and you're a clumsy oaf, you'll probably drop them a lot. I certainly do. And I get them wet sometimes too, which leads me into the next point that the, cons the professional ones are often dust and weather sealed, which means if you're um, in the situation that Stuart was in, for example, and he was using the, the Sony lenses, which are quite good and mostly are weather sealed, then um, you'll not have a problem if they get a little bit wet. I've just seen a question from Akshat who talk about ISO and shutter speed. We'll be doing those in a previous, sorry, in a future session, not a previous session. Uh, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. The professional ones are usually got a very clever scientific design to avoid distortion in the images. Now, it's not the case with all of them, and I'll certainly show you some of the things that happen in the images when you do get a little bit of distortion. Now, consumer lenses are usually really good in the sweet spot for that lens. So every consumer lens has a particular place that was designed to try and meet. And if you use it in inside those parameters, and generally you won't find out what that sweet spot is until you actually try it. And it's often different for copies of the same lens. And I say copies because in manufacturing, you might make a thousand individual lenses and they're all copies of each other or copies of a master. Professional ones are often brighter than the consumer ones and what I, I'll, I'll cover that in a bit more detail shortly. Professional ones usually have the same aperture through their entire focal length so if you're zooming and your lens is f2.8 which is just the size of the hole that the light comes through, a professional lens will often be 2.8 no matter what your zoom range is. Whereas the consumer ones might start at, say, f3.5, but the hole gets smaller as you zoom the lens. And you might end up with something like f6.3 or even 7.1 at the furthest end of the zoom, which is OK as long as you know how to deal with it and you understand what's happening. The pro ones are often maintainable. 
And what I mean by that is that it's not something that you yourself take apart and maintain because these things are horribly complex. Um, I have tried to repair some vintage lenses in my time. I've been successful with a couple, but I, I would never try and take one of these apart. But they are maintainable in the sense that the manufacturer can renew them for you. So you basically hand them over, you pay a fee, and they give you back what is essentially a brand new lens, but it's the same one you had. They just clean it up and make it all good again. Whereas the consumer ones tend to be throw away. So if I dropped this lens, for example, um, I'm not going to tell you how much this was, but it's scary. Um, if I dropped this lens, it would be worth my while to have it fixed if I broke it or if I damaged it. But if I dropped, say, this one, which is a cheap, nasty little Samyang, to be honest, I'd just go and buy another one because <laughs> they're just not worth it. Now. I talked about brightness a little bit before. That's the size of the hole that the light's coming through into the lens. I'm not actually sure if you'll be able to see it in the Samyang. No, I think the aperture is too a bit too. Well, you might just see it. I'll try. So you can kind of see that that, see that little spot of light, it's getting bigger and smaller. That's the aperture changing. So that's how much light's coming in and how much light gets to your sensor. And the reason that that's important, it's about depth of field, which we're gonna cover in a future session, but it's also about what kinds of photographs you can actually take with that lens. So if you are asked to take photographs of a play or perhaps a, a ceremony or an activity or a religious thing, or you wanna do photos at a music show, you need a really bright lens because you're going to be struggling to get light because it's always really dark in those places. So you need a lens that's at the brighter end. So you'll notice on my chart here, I start at F16, which is probably about as far as you'd want to go. And that's the smallest hole. Um, it's the furthest I'll shoot with on a modern digital camera. After F16, a lot of them, apart from some large full frame ones, will um, cause issues once you get over F16. Let's just leave it there because I don't want to get too technical. Um, F8 is a good all round. So F8 gives you a nice depth of field. So if you're shooting things that are happening outside and you've got lots of light and you'll get a, a good focal distance. Now we'll talk about that a lot in a future session. So I won't go into it much here. F4 is a good all rounder and it's a, a medium sort of hole size. Um, it's often the best hole size that the consumer lenses have. There are exceptions. Um, Canon, for example, make a really nice 50 millimeter lens that actually goes down to 1.8, and it's ridiculously cheap. It's only about $100. F2.8 is where I like to shoot most of the time, and F2.8 tends to be mostly in professional lenses. There certainly are some consumer ones that go there, um, particularly in prime lenses, which we'll talk about more shortly. F1.2 is just brilliant. Um, I've only got one lens that does 1.2, and that's this one. It lets in so much light that I can shoot in a dark theater, and I can shoot as though it's daylight. So I can capture movement, I can get things still, which is really, really important if you've got um, a director, Ananda knows this particular person, he's an absolutely wonderful guy named Roberto, but if he's screaming in your ear that he wants a still shot and everything's moving, you've got to give him a still shot. Now, the difference in the lenses, so this is a shot of my son working on some of his images and there's, this was with a very cheap consumer camera, and you can tell that it's got a, a lot of detail in this image, whereas the thing I'd really like to concentrate on is him. But there's a lot of other stuff that makes the image quite distracting. I mean, you can even read some of the paperwork if you try hard enough in the background. The brighter lenses are handy when you're shooting things. So this is a, a model shoot that I did, um, named Sarah. It's actually her first model shoot, so she did really well. But this one's a, a Panasonic lens. It's a consumer grade lens. It does go down to f1.7. So remember, I, I did say some consumer grade lenses are really bright, but the way the lens is constructed, 
means that the bokeh or boka, depending on how you try and say it, those shiny little spots in the background, they're quite rough and they're very spotty and they're quite large. And that can be good if you're shooting at night and you want the bright spots from lights and things in the background. So if you've got something like, I don't know, the celebratory lights like around Christmas time and holly and things like that can be really nice if they're done this way, but they're not so nice the rest of the time because they distract you from whatever you were trying to shoot. Now, this is that Canon one I was talking about before. Um, I don't shoot Canon stuff anymore. I actually sold all my gear and bought a different brand. That's okay. Uh, these lenses, so this one does quite well in dark situations. And in this one, I was at a gymnasium and I was shooting people doing boxing. And it was quite dark in there, but this lens does manage it. But more importantly, it makes quite a nice smooth background. So while I know there's a brick wall in the background, you probably can't tell because it's nice and smooth. And that's what the, the better quality of lenses gets you. So this one's called a prosumer, which is sort of halfway between the consumer and the, the permanent one or the professional one. Now, when you start getting into professional glass, you'll notice in the background here with this model April is that there's two things that you'll see here. The sharpness around her face is really, really good. So exactly where I focused, exactly where I chose to have a nice sharp appearance is where it is sharp. But behind her, you can see a wonderful, smooth, creamy, now I think the word I used in the presentation was dreamy. I meant to type creamy and then I typed dreamy and I thought, no, nah, dreamy's better. So I kept it. Uh, and you can see what that background looks like. So for me, that's important, but it doesn't always have to be important for all shots. For some of them, I think it is. So for this shot with April, it would have only worked because I can get that nice background. The background behind her was so busy that it would have detracted from the shot. But you don't always need to do it. And one thing I will say is that your creativity is more important than the camera and the lens or the glass that you've got. You'll often hear lenses referred to as glass. And I really do mean that. While professional lenses can give you some things that make your life much easier as a photographer, there's nothing that you can't do with a consumer lens. And if you like the creamy, dreamy look in the background that you can't necessarily achieve with a consumer lens, you can certainly do it in post-processing afterwards in whatever your favorite post-processing tool is. So you can do a little bit of work, but you can still make it happen. So if I go through the, the lens types, now we'll look at all these individually as well, but I'll just start holding them up. So we start with, and I'll show you what the these lenses actually do as well. So I've got some sample images that I'll go through for all of these. But if we start with the ultra wide or the fisheye, I just need to get rid of the chat for a while so I can see what I'm showing you and make sure you can see it. So can you see that this lens is a bit round on the top? Now this lens that is a fisheye lens and they're, they're kind of fun for artistic things and special effects. They're also really handy if you're doing 360 photography because this is a, almost a full 180 degree view. So the half circle around you. I'll show you why that's good and bad in a moment. But if you're doing a 360, you do one shot that way and then one shot that way and blend them later on and you've got a full spear. So the pro of these lenses is that you can capture nearly anything and you can almost shoot round corners and you'll see why that's good and bad in a moment. The con is you get distortion and you get weird shapes in the images. The next one is a wide angle. Now this one, you'll be able to see the glass in there. I hope you can see it. It's really got pronounced curvature. So it's actually round. The this lens is actually the same width as this one. So this one, seven millimeter to 12, I think. Yep, seven to 14, sorry. And this one, 7.5, it's fixed. But this one doesn't have the distortion that this one has. And you'll see that in the sample images shortly because it's got some really clever optics that fix it. Now it certainly does have distortion because anytime you put a lens this wide on, um, you're going to see some distortion in your images. And I'll show you what that means shortly. You probably get sick of me saying that, but what they're really good for is local guide stuff. 
they're good for buildings and architecture, real estate shots. And if you're out in a massive landscape like those mountains that Vandana was in before, this sort of lens means you can capture more of it, but it does have a drawback, which I'll show you. So it's really good for big scenes, but you do have a lot of distortion and you exaggerate your linear perspective quite a bit. So uh, lines that are supposed to be nice and straight won't be with this kind of lens. You can certainly fix it. There's a lot of post-processing tools that are really, really good at fixing straight lines that aren't straight anymore, but that does change your image a little bit. Then we get into things like a standard prime. I can show you a couple of those. Oops, there goes the lens cap for that one. This one is a, a thingify lens. This one's actually special. It's a um, pinhole lens, which means it actually has no glass in it. If I can show you, you can, I don't know if you can see through it because it's such a tiny hole, but there's actually no glass in these ones. And they're, they're really cool for some fun effects. It's like taking a photography back to the 1800s. Sounds silly that you'd want something that wasn't sharp, but you get sick of sharp. Now, the standard prime, these are absolutely fantastic for things like portraits, wildlife, street, and in a local guide's context, food. They're beautiful for food because you can do really cool images. They see a lot like your eye does. So your eye actually sees at about 35 millimeters. 35 millimeter on my camera, um, if I put a 35 lens on here, it's actually about 70. I'll talk about that in a future session of why that's different. But primes, because they see like your eye, are the easiest ones for you to work with because you're used to looking at things that way. You're used to seeing what the camera is going to show you. Whereas some of the other lenses can be a little bit confusing. Um, they do have a limited range in that you can't zoom these things. They're just that one, one single focal length. So if you want to bring something closer, you've got to walk towards it or change lenses. When you've got a zoom, which is, where's he ah, I'm a nuffy, it's on the camera. But if you've got a zoom, then you can change the lens so that it gets bigger, essentially. That's the simplest way to put it. Um, it just lengthens the lens and it brings things closer towards you when you do that. The zoom lens are really good for portraits, event photography, wildlife, uh, candid street photography. You can get closer without physically moving and you can change the frame, which makes it easier to compose. They can introduce some barrel and pin cushion distortion where your images don't quite look right and you might get a little bit of curving in them or you might get some distortion around the edges. I personally find that's okay because I tend to put onto the thirds quadrants or I center the thing that I want to take a picture of. When you get into telephoto, these are the big ones. Uh, they're good for wildlife, sports. They bring far away things much, much closer. They do also have drawbacks. They are large and they are heavy and they are often slow. Now, slow is two things. When you're focusing over a long distance, some lenses take a really long time to do it. This one's pretty quick because it's in one of the professional ones. But if you've got consumer grade stuff, you might be waiting a while. And that can mean that maybe you miss the shot, which can be a little bit unhappy. Uh, now, the other one, there's actually two more I'm going to show you, one that's not on the list. But this last one is a macro. Now, I've included macro in this session because a lot of people asked about it from the last session. So macro lenses let you take photos of little teeny weeny things and make them really big. So it's a lot of fun. It's actually a challenging way to do photography. Uh, and we'll get into that because I'll show you some stuff later. Now, this one, you're going to think I'm breaking this. This one bends. So. It's called a lens baby. This is a composer too, I think from memory. No, it's a composer pro. Uh, it, it's not much different to the other ones. It's used for moving the center of the image. So everybody's used to having these wonderful sharp images. These are actually deliberately not sharp, but I'll show you what that does in just a moment. Just get back to my presentation. So 
you can see my range and one thing you'll probably notice in this image is you can probably tell which ones of those lenses are newer than the other ones. And in the case of the macro, which one doesn't get used very much because macros are a very specific thing. That's what I was saying about the professional things is that they handle a lot of rough stuff. So I'm pretty awful to my camera equipment. And it's like any tool. If you're buying a screwdriver, if you go down to the supermarket and buy a screwdriver, it's gonna break the second or third time you use it. If you go to a tool shop and you buy a good quality screwdriver, it will probably last you for the rest of your life and the rest of your kids' lives and possibly your grandkids' lives if you're lucky enough to have them. Now, I'm going to go through a series of shots. Now, what I did is I went outside. Fortunately, we're allowed out again. Yay! Not quite everywhere, but most places. Um, and I deliberately put up a tripod and I took all of these from the same viewpoint. So these, from a composition perspective, aren't going to be very nice because that's not what I was trying to show. I used F8 all the way through, so a fairly small hole to try and give a good depth of field all the way through the whole lot. And I show the widest and the narrowest for each of the lenses. Now, I've just noticed a few things popping up in the chat. So just before I go through those, I'll just have a quick look. Um, Jess mentioned that she used to have a wide lens on the previous phone. And yes, it is very, very helpful. And it does have some distortion a little bit, you're right. Um, and when I'm talking about lenses, it's actually a really good point. The phone lenses often work the same way as the ones I'm talking about. So the same things are coverable across those. Uh, Vandana mentioned that I have a lot of lenses. Um, this is nothing. <laughs> I have a lot more than this. I've been collecting for quite a long time and I've got a lot of old lenses from ranging back from the late 1800s up to fairly recent stuff about the 70s and 80s. And I've got my current gear. I've got a big gap between the 70s and 80s and the current gear though. Um, and it is, and Ander points out that it, it's great to borrow lenses from your friends. Um, I'm, and he says, but for self-preservation, watch that quote friend unquote that breaks your gear. So he and I both know someone who's quite famous for falling into the sea and falling into lakes and dropping things and sticking his finger in things where it doesn't belong. And yeah, we've both fallen victim to that particular individual. Well, I won't mention because it's a bit mean and he might watch the video and then he'd get me. So if we go and have a look through our lenses, the first one is the Samyang fisheye. This is a really fun little lens. And if you've never played with a fisheye, I encourage you to get your hands on one and have a bit of a go. If you've got a phone, it's wider setting probably is a fish. It's good for fun stuff and artistic shots, but you'll notice that drawback. Remember I talked to you, it's almost a 180 degree shot. Up in the top right hand corner of that image, what can you see? That's my finger pressing the button. <laughs> I can't avoid putting that finger there. It has to be there to press the button, but it's actually in the shot, which is kind of tedious because it means I have to crop it out later. Uh, someone's just asked a question. I'm just waiting for the chat to refresh. Some I mean, Feliciana said Sam Yang reminds me of a Korean instant noodle. Yeah, it does kind of. <laughs> um, Rosie asked how many total lenses I have. It's actually about 70. And starting learning photography, which lens should you have? That's easy. Get one that suits what you want to do. Now, this lens, the 12 to 100, which I bought last year, just before Connect, I got this one because it's a great range for traveling. So this, on a, on a full frame camera, this would be a 24 to 200, which is a, a really good range for everyone. There's not much you'd want to do outside of that range, generally speaking. So I have to say, having put this one on the camera in about October last year, it's not often I take it off, especially this year because it couldn't go outside. The next one is that wide that I showed you, and you can certainly see some wear marks on this lens. It's been through hell. It's uh, been in waterfalls. It's been everywhere. It's a cool thing about having uh, waterproof stuff. Uh, someone did just talk about an 18 to 55 lens. That is actually a very common one. The 
So this is a 7 to 14 millimeter. It's 2.8, so it's nice and bright. It's really good for architecture, big landscapes, but you're not going to see a lot of detail, and that's its drawback. So when we look in the image, that same image we got before, it's almost the same frame that we had from the Samyo. It's really close. It's not distorted, because you'll notice that the line of that fence in the foreground is still fairly straight. There's a bit of weirdness going on in the corners. And if you look at the top right-hand corner where the sun is, and I have to say I framed it this way deliberately to highlight this, you get a bit of lens flare as you cross that image from right to left and from top to bottom. Lens flare is fun. It's great for when you're using it creatively, but if you're trying to do something and you don't want that flare, it can be really annoying, and you might have to use something like a hat or a T-shirt or something to try and block the sun out of it. Now, your foreground gets exaggerated, so the fence and those trees are actually much bigger than they really are. But your distant things are really distant. You can barely even see what's happening, and it's only a couple of hundred metres from us. When you go wide, or you bring it, zoom in a little bit, it gets a little bit better. So you're getting into the, the 14 millimetres. You've still got strong flare things happening. And in this one, I don't know if you can see it, but I can certainly see some distortion. I can see this horizon, for example, is actually curved, which for me is a little bit cringy because I like a flat horizon. It's the only thing in photography that I've never been able to get over. I've gotten over things not being sharp. I can be deliberately unsharp. I kind of actually like it. But a horizon for me has just got to be flat. We get into our standard primes. They come in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of sizes, loads of them. Um, Alphys just asked a question about mirrorless adapters, so let me deal with that when the chat refreshes. Sorry about the pauses, but the chat keeps disappearing. Uh, what do I think about mirrorless lenses adapter to get the same image quality connected to any of your lens family? That's actually a, a fairly interesting question when you're using adapters. If you're using a really good adapter, like a Metabones, and you can feel free to Google Metabones, M-E-T-A-B-O-N-E-S, you can run almost any lens on almost any camera if you buy the right set of adapters. And they're almost as good and almost as fast as they are native. So the Sony, for example, does that Stuart's got, can run Canon lenses. And it does a really nice job of it. And the fast autofocus on those lenses actually works pretty well with a Metabones adapter. But if you use a cheap adapter that's just adapting the format and perhaps not the electronics or it's adapting the electronics in a poor way, you'll have a bad experience. Now, if you're trying to build up your lens collection and you've changed camera platforms. So some years ago, I changed from the Canon platform to the Olympus platform. It took some of my friends, uh, Ananda's one of them that's here tonight, probably four or five years to convince me that it was worth doing. And it's a big choice to make. It's a really big choice. If you move not only brand, but format, so the connector that the lens uses and the size of the sensor, it's quite a big change to your photography because you might have built up quite a good collection. So in the gear that I had before, um, I shouldn't say this too loud because my wife will hear it, I had about $20,000 worth of lenses. I've probably spent 10, maybe 12, going into the new platform. And that's a big deal. But the advantage is my Old lenses held their value. That's another cool thing about professional glasses. It holds its value. It tends not to get cheaper. And I was able to buy all of the new gear by selling all my old gear. But it takes a long time to do that, and it takes a long time to build your collection up again. So an adapter can be a good interim measure, but I think you'll be unhappy if you use it forever. Uh, we just had a, can I recommend a cheap mirrorless camera? Um, I could, but I won't. What I'll do, and I, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to be um, arrogant or anything like that. What I prefer people to do is to go to a camera store, and you can't do this online, so please go to a real store, support a real store, because they do a lot of work to look after us. 
um, and try different cameras, try different platforms, try different lenses and see what suits you, see what you like, because everybody's gonna need differences. If you're traveling, like Bandana took those amazing shots in the Himalayas, probably carrying all of her worldly possessions in a pack on her back, you don't wanna carry 20 kilograms with the camera equipment. You're gonna take a, a small portable camera that suits that job. Likewise, if you're like me and you go for a three hour hike to go and find a waterfall that someone told you about and you can't find it on maps, but you can kind of see a depression in the landscape where it might be, and you're gonna find a track and bush bash your way in there, you don't want a really heavy camera. So my camera with this lens on it weighs a about 1.2 kilos, which is a lot if you're hiking. It's an awful lot. I mean, people who um, hike, let, let's call it professionally if you like, um, I've done it, you'll go to the extent of cutting the end off your toothbrush and just taking the head. You'll cut down your knife and fork to make them shorter to get rid of some weight because you've got to carry that crap all day, every day on your back and it's just wearing. So the less you've got, the better. So we'll get back into our primes, have a look at what it does for you. What the prime gives you usually, and this is the same for nearly every prime lens from nearly every manufacturer, is it gives you a flat, clear, sharp image. Normally there's very little distortion in a prime because they don't have to have the conflicting needs of engineering something that can move. So they're much, that's why primes are much cheaper as well. And you can get really good primes for quite a little bit cheaper. Um, Akshat's asked, is there a difference in quality between mirrorless and DSLR? Um, no, not really. Particularly if you're publishing images for the web. If you are printing a billboard, you probably want a DSLR or a medium format in a full frame. If you're doing anything else, you probably don't need that much resolution. I know people go out of their way and do something like buy a 50 megapixel camera. You just really don't need it. Stuart looks like he wants to disagree with me. <laughs> um, when you get into zooms, as I said before, this one's a, an awesome traveling lens. And if you can take one lens traveling, even if you're not hiking, just because you're walking around all day, like last year, I was lucky enough to go to Connect, wonderful experience. And before that, I went to New York probably walked, I don't know, 40, 50 kilometers around New York. And carrying one lens is much better than carrying five. So the zoom with this one, it's a nice clean lens, which is something I look for. The distance is a little bit compressed. So you, you, you sort of feel like things are a little bit closer than they really are in the image. There's a slight curve to the horizon on this one because they do have the challenges of going from what is essentially almost an ultra wide up to a telephoto. Uh, Isha asked, can 360 photographs be taken with a mobile phone camera? They certainly can, but it's a very interesting thing to do. You end up taking about 250 shots and you look a little bit like a ballerina. There's some good articles on um, the Street View Trusted Professional site for how to do it. And if you download the Street View app, from Google onto your phone, whether it's Android or iPhone, they both support it. Um, it will actually walk you through what you need to do. And you'll certainly get what I mean once it's walked you through, because it actually pops little blue dots on the screen and you have to move around to cover each of the blue dots in your sphere. With the zoom, when you zoom out, it brings things closer to you. So you see, we can see this construction equipment at the end of this pier. It's a horrible dim dark day so please excuse the quality of the image i don't like it it's a bit noisy but it'll do for this particular thing but you can start to see some of the detail of the machinery that's down there you can certainly see all of the shapes and you can even get quite a good resolution rendition of people on the pier at this level of zoom it's got quite a nice level of horizon but if I go back to the previous one, you'll notice the horizon was slightly curved. So when it's at 12 millimeters, it does have this curve, but when it's zoomed out the other way, it doesn't. It's okay as long as you're used to it. The telephoto one, so this one is a 40 to 150, which barely qualifies as a telephoto really, because normally they're much bigger than this. And I've got a, a teleconverter on this one, which is like a lens for a lens. So it goes onto the back. 
and it magnifies the lens. So it just gives it a bit more range. Very useful for sports and wildlife. I find I don't use this one much because even though it's only half the weight of the lenses from the body system I came from, it's still bloody heavy. So I don't use it much at all. It's probably a waste of money to be honest with you. Uh, it gives you a nice flat horizon. It's sharp right through. It gives you enough detail for memory. So essentially where this lens leaves off is about where this one starts. But you can zoom right in and you can get some really interesting details. So if it wasn't such a horrible dark day, I could have done better here. You, you can just barely see the mesh on those windows. Um, you can certainly see cable on the winching drums and on the crane, which you couldn't see with the other lenses. On a nice bright day, um, you'd be able to see the faces of the people on that pier from 250 odd metres away. And it lets you get right in on things and, and fill your frame, which is something I like doing. And we get on to the, the lens baby, the bendy lens. It's an artistic lens. It's nothing else for it. It's just for artistic things, for playing around. It's for having fun, essentially. And I use it quite a bit in street photography because in street photography, you're trying to highlight something interesting that's going on. But in a crowded street scene where there's a lot of movement and a lot of color, it can be hard to direct people to that interesting thing. So in this particular place, you can see the um, guy with all of his studs and his mohawk and things. He's quite clearly looking at the woman that's walking away from him. I've no idea why, but he was quite fixated on her. There's nothing particularly out of the ordinary about it or nothing that I would think would attract your attention. But because I've used the lens baby, it takes away all of that distraction and just lets you see the thing that you want to see. The downside is even in its sharp point, it isn't sharp. And then does ask me if I've shown the people who think the earth is flat. Yeah, they're kind of funny. <laughs> And the last one I'm going to show you tonight is the macro lens. So a lot of people asked about this, the little macro fella. It's quite a lot of fun. And I went out and I shot some shots today for this. And I, I, I have to admit, I'd kind of forgotten how much fun macro is. So it's not a lot of use for local guides, but it's awesome for documenting your surroundings and turning your surroundings into art. And I'll show you what I mean. So you can get some amazing detail. This is actually shot with the Canon 105 macro, which will work on a Sony Stuart. <laughs> it's a beautiful lens. It's probably one of the best lenses I've ever owned. I don't own it anymore. I believe it actually financed that one. <laughs> but you'll see things that you've never seen before. So you've probably all seen baby mosquitoes wriggling around in, a, in some water somewhere. But have you ever seen that they've got little hairs coming out of them? It's just cool, some of the things you can pick up. Amazing all the other things that were in this drop of water that I just sucked up from a pond too and put onto a, a little black piece of glass. All these other bits and pieces are in there that you just don't see. So it opens up a new world to you. So you find things that you didn't really know were there. So in this shot, I was outside. It's not the nicest rose in the world. It's a bit chewed because I've got an aphid problem in my garden. It's a nice rose, but when you get in a bit closer, you notice something. There's a, a hair or something in there, and there's some little things. And you go in a bit closer again, and this is about as far as you can get with this macro lens. They're baby aphids. So they, they're the next generation of what's eating my roses. So. Again, a new world, and who knows where the hair came from? Probably here. <laughs> and the reason I say you can use it for art, this is a tomato from my garden. Something decided it wanted it more than I did, so it had it. But there's so much texture and color and shape when you get in really close to a little tomato that it's really, really cool. Um, Akshat asked what aperture macro lenses have. Um, this one ranges from 3.5 right up to, I think it's 32 actually for this one, from memory. But um, actually it's 2.8 I just noticed. So it's varying with all of the, the macro lenses. 
and I just just pick up one thing that you said, um, Akshat. Um, you asked about a micro lens. A micro is different again. Micro is smaller again. Micro is for microscopes. You can take pictures through a microscope, but it's bloody hard. It's very hard to find the focus and get a good depth of field from a macro lens. From a microscope, it's almost impossible. That's why they sandwich stuff between bits of glass. Now, where the macro most comes in, and this is why I say it's so much fun, is it lets you start to generate, generate's the wrong word, it lets you unleash some of your art. And the shapes and colors and textures that you can find just in your garden are really amazing. The things that are on this earth are amazing. Probably a lot better off without us, but that's a different story. So this is just a simple daisy with some water drops on it from some rain this morning. But it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. This is a little jade plant and you get some really cool compositions and you, you do get a very shallow depth of field, which we'll cover properly in a future session. But you'll notice in this one, anybody that knows jade plants or some of the other names they're known by, the leaf is only about two millimeters thick, tiny things. And that leaf that's immediately behind it is out of focus. So that certainly gives you some idea. And Ananda's just made a point there. Do you want to unmute and talk about that, Ananda? Yep, I'm un unmuted. Um, yeah, uh, macro lens uh, may have a bright aperture of uh, 2.8 or 3.5. Uh, they don't normally come uh, brighter than that. Um, and that's to help you s have enough light uh, to focus and to let the autofocus system in the camera help you focus. Um, but that's not what you should add um, because to get enough depth of field, even if you do uh, amazing special techniques like focus stacking, um, you're going to shoot at f8, f11, f16. Um, you're always going to shoot at a very small dark aperture. Um, otherwise, you won't get enough depth of field. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ananda. Um, this image actually is focus stacked. It's. I'll, I'll talk about that technique very briefly. Um, the, I'm lucky enough that my camera platform does can do focus stacking by itself. It's one of its really cool features. <laughs> Ned is laughing his ass off. Um, this is eight shots, and I set a focus point, hit the button. The camera takes eight shots, moving the lens slightly each time, and then it blends them all together using what it perceives as the sharpest parts of each of those images, and creates the final result. And you do get a little bit more depth of field. It's not a lot. If you want a lot more depth of field from macro photography, you're going to need to do manual focus stacking. I'm not going to go into that topic because it's frankly bloody difficult. <laughs> There's some really good software out there that helps you, but even that's really difficult to drive, I find. Uh, other people have great success with it. Um, Akshat wants to talk about ISO and shutter speed. We're talking about ISO next week. I think we're talking about shutter speed next week too, and some more about aperture. It's a big topic, aperture. The other kind of thing you can do with macro, and this is a, a little bit of the artistic side of things, is because of the way it works, you can sort of see through things, sort of. And any lens can do this really, but you might not notice it in your other photos because you tend not to be close to things. In this one, there's actually several leaves above the one I shot with the water drops on it. But I'm shooting through the gaps. Because the things that are outside of my depth of field are so out of focus, you kind of can't see that they're there. You just see some dreamy coloration where those, where those are. It's just kind of cool. I like it. You get to see interesting things. So is it a rugged landscape or is it some food? And if it is food, what is it? I can tell you what this is. It's um, Greek pit pitta made with feta. And uh, my mother-in-law made that this morning. It's a little bit too much detail for a maps food photograph. Just a little bit. But it's still a lot of fun. 
So we're getting into the last part of this session tonight and then we'll open up for questions and I'm about to talk to you about your tasks for this week. There's actually two, but you can combine them. The first thing I want to talk to you about is leading lines. Now, one of Vandana's shots that we saw earlier tonight, which was a wooden boardwalk going into, yeah. Iwede just says, why does she feel like I fell in love with macro? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's really cool. I love it. Um, but leading lines can take your eye on a journey. And it's one of the tricks in photography to get you to look where the photographer wants you to look. So if you want someone to look at a particular place, try and get yourself somewhere in that composition where things lead away from you towards that place because people's eyes tend to naturally follow lines. They tend to naturally follow funnels because it's just how we see stuff. So in this particular case, this is on the New York High Line, which is a, it's, can't really call it an abandoned railway anymore. It's more of an arts precinct these days, but it used to be an abandoned railway. You can just see some railway track down on the right-hand side there. Um, these lines of the concrete path are leading you down into the arch structure, which I'm pretty sure was called doorways from memory. It's very creative. It's the same kind of name I probably would have given it because, you know, I've got that sort of imagination. And it's leading you towards the people that are walking away from you, but they're also going on a journey. So the lines are taking you into the artwork, taking you to the people, and the people are going in the same direction as the lines. So for me, this is what I like to see in a composition. You don't have to do it, and I often don't do it, but it just makes an image to me easier to look at because you know where, where you want to go and you know what the photographer wanted you to look at, especially in this one, which is surrounded by so much chaos of all of those leaves. This is a, um, oh, what's the word? It's a, typical is not the right word. <laughs> I've lost the word I was looking for. I should have put it in the presentation. But anyway, th this is a very, very typical New York image that you see a lot. You see it a lot in their TV shows. You see it a lot in um, the arts or that people tend to take from New York because you've got all these taxis, you've got all this wonderful red brick architecture that the, the city is famous for. Again, leading lines takes you off into the nice misty distance and it takes you on a bit of a journey through a very crowded, very heavy traffic afternoon, which is about bog standard for New York, by the way, except at the moment, I saw an image shot from this place only this morning and I was trying to get hold of the person to get permission to show it to you, but I haven't been able to reach them. I wish I could because it's the exact same scene, but it's completely empty. There's no one there, no cars, no people, nothing. And to me, I loved it. I actually wish I was in that city right now, apart from the fact I'd probably die while I was there. So the leading lines in this one tame all of that chaos. So there's all of the windows, there's the lights, traffic lights, car headlights, people with umbrellas, trees. There's all these things trying to get your attention. But the leading lines going in underneath the bridge and going up that road just draw you on that journey. It's hard to resist that journey. I keep using the word journey, but I do kind of like it. So our two tasks for this week. Now, when you do these tasks, I want you to try and remember the rule of thirds and fill the frame and simple and clean from last week. You all did really well on that. I'm quite proud of what you did. I was quite impressed. And I'd like you to share into the album. I've already shared the link to that one in the chat, but I'll just flip out of the presentation and, oops, going ahead of myself, and I'll just paste this into the chat again. So we've got a, a fresh one to make it easier for people to find because paging through this chat is very interesting. I'm just waiting for the chat to catch up again. It's being very weird today. I hope it's not being weird for you guys. So your first task, leading the zoom. So I imagine most of you have got a zoom lens of some kind. Oh, I've somehow turned captions on. That's a novelty. I think I might just turn that off so I don't record them. Now, I imagine most of you have got a zoom lens of some kind, whether it's your phone, 
whether it's a point and shoot camera, whether it's a, uh, um, a DSLR or a mirrorless or a professional, don't care, you can probably do this. I want you to take three photos of the same thing at different zoom levels from closest, middle, and furthest, and see if you can find a subject where you're shooting on a path or a track or some colored lines. It doesn't really matter what it is, a zebra crossing, anything like that. Um, if you're still locked up at home, you could go up one end of a table and put some things onto the table and shoot along that, or you could shoot along a window frame or something like that. What I want you to do that for is to try and get some perspective on what happens with your lens while you're doing the zoom. So when you take the pictures, I particularly want you to look dead center in the middle, and that's where I want you to focus. So center the thing, now I know I said rule of thirds, but I'm going against it a little bit. Center the thing that you want to focus on, because that's probably the sweet spot in your lens. It's probably the sharpest point. But I want you to look at what happened around the outsides, and then move your zoom about halfway, and look at what happened around the outside again, and then move to the furthest extent of your zoom. Yes, it's fine with the mobile camera, Shreya. You should still be able to do this. Um, but if you use the Google camera or the Apple camera, they both support zoom in some ways. Even if the phone physically doesn't, you'll be able to do digital zoom. And But I want you to look at what happens around the outside as you go, because it'll get you to a, a little bit of an understanding of your lens and what your camera can do. The next one, and you don't need a macro lens for this, but get in as close to something as you can. Phones are actually really good at it, at least the recent ones are. And you can do some amazing, very near macro shots with a phone. So just get in as close as you can. And remember the tap to focus method. You might, for this shot, maybe put your phone on something. I happen to have a jar of salsa here. So if you put your phone on the jar of salsa and hold it, and the thing that you're taking a picture of is just under it, you'll get a nice steady shot just to help you steady things. So not holding it up in the air like this, down on a table. <laughs> um, that's just to help you steady it because when you're doing close in shots, the tiniest movement wrecks the shot. So those are your two tasks. So we're gonna do lines and zoom with three shots. And we're going to get in as close as we can to something and take it with any kind of camera device that you've got. So at that point, we'll open up for questions. We're a little bit over time, but that's kind of normal for this workshop. So <laughs> let's see how we go with the question. So anybody that's got one, feel free to unmute and we can start talking. I'll just stop presenting so that we can see each other. So has anybody got any questions today? No? <laughs> I have a question. Hi, Paul. Oh, sorry. I'll, yeah. I'll let you go first. Yeah, you go first. Start. It's OK. Well, we'll take Fel Feliciana first, if you like. Oh, okay. I, I, I enjoyed like to... coming to your meetup, by the way. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah, about the, the second task, uh, to take the photo as close as possible. Do yep. we need to use the zoom, zoom in mode in our camera? Uh, no, not really. If, if you've got that and it works for you with getting in close to things, by all means use it. But um, just get in as close as you can with whatever your camera will let you do. So I'm not expecting people to have a macro or a zoom. Just do what you can do. And if it's a phone, that's perfectly OK. That's fine. Oh, OK. And um, I want to ask one more question. Before, uh, we, move, before we move on to your second question, um, interestingly, mm -hmm. one of the other ways to do macro, if you've got a large zoom telephoto, you can actually use these, but they often won't focus close, but that's okay because they bring that thing really close to the lens anyway, even if you can't get close to it. So you can take a macro photo with a telephoto lens. And your second question, okay. Feliciana? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? Nowadays, the, the development of the smartphone is very amazing, right? Like, you know, like Indeed. Google Pixel, iPhone. Samsung, yeah. Uh, in your opinion, as a professional photographer, can the lens on the high-end smartphone replace the lens in the SLR or in 
like mirrorless cameras? Um, for general sorts of travel photography, yes. <laughs> for some kinds of portrait photography, yes. But it depends what you need. Um, if you're trying to get a particular look, you might struggle a bit using a phone. There are magic things that you can do with a camera that the phones haven't quite managed to do. And one thing that's important to think about the phones is they do use a very small lens and a very small sensor. And we briefly talked about it last week. They use what is essentially software tricks and they process the image that they create to make an image that looks like it was taken on a great big sensor with a great big lens. And they're really, really good at it. Is the technology getting much better every day? Yeah. Is the technology in a phone as good as in even an average camera? Smartphone. No, yeah. but it is pretty good. So if a phone is the only kind of camera you've got, it's perfect. If mm. you are shooting shots for maps, the phone's great. It really is. I actually yeah. do most of my map shots on a phone because I'm lazy and I couldn't be bothered <laughs> transferring the images from my camera onto the phone to upload to maps. And yeah. I find that if I go, oh, I'll do that when I get home, I'll transfer it to the computer and then I'll upload it, I probably never will. <laughs> and then five years later, <laughs> I find it and go, oh, I could have put that on maps, a bit late now. Okay. So um, will they get? You, will they get to that point? Probably. Yeah. I mean, sensor yeah. electronics is changing a lot. The A lot of the big brand manufacturers and even my particular favourite, um, Ananda might correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the sensor in this camera has been the same one for since about 2015, Ananda, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah something like that. So it's pretty long lived, but it's probably at the end of its life. I'd really love it if their new camera actually had a better one, but... Yeah, well, they just released one and it didn't. <laughs> so um, I won't buy their new one because there's no advantage for me. If they'd gone to the next step up in sensor, maybe I would have. But that's life. Uh, um, Stuart, you had a question. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, my, my question's about the um, the labelling of lenses, this uh, size in, in millimetres. I find it really, really confusing. I'm interested in in experimenting with a, a wider lens. But when I when I research online, it I don't know, I just find it really, really confusing. I, I'm using a box standard lens which says 16 to 50 millimeters on my mirrorless. And it's not it's a standard lens, it's not wide angle. And yet when I find a wide angle supposedly a wide angle lens uh, online, it also says 16 millimeters, but it said it's super wide. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is very confusing. So one of the things you need to take into account is the size of your sensor. One of the reasons I like the Olympus is its sensor is exactly two times smaller than a full frame sensor. So a full frame is that good old fashioned 35 millimeter film frame near enough. I think it's actually something like 36.2 or something bizarre like that. Um, and because mine's two times that, my lens, they're marked as though they're 35 millimeter frames. So my 12 to 100, which I don't know if you can see it or not, just marked on there, 12 to 100. It's actually 24 to 200 in 35 millimeter land. And that's what it effectively is because that's the imaging circle that it's going to generate on top of your sensor. So that's why when you move from a full frame, you might have had um, the idea that a 15 millimeter lens was really wide, and it is. If you had a seven millimeter lens on a full frame camera, that would be unbelievably wide. <laughs> but when you're going down to a smaller size, and most of the DSLRs that live in the affordable ranges tend to be a 1.6 or a 1.3 multiplier. And then you get down into the micro four thirds and some of their other mirrorless brands, they're a two times multiplier. And it comes down to your sensors getting smaller, even though your imaging circle is similar. Uh, and it is really confusing. And it can be quite annoying to do that maths in your head. Like, is my sensor a 1.3 or a 1.6 or a two, or is it the other way? So if you're shooting with a medium format camera, 
but you're using a 35 millimeter lens, you might have to go the other way. And that can get even more annoying because <laughs> your brain's not used to thinking that way. So yeah, the lens markings are really confusing. I kind of don't get why they do it. I kind of think it's marketing because to me, I would prefer that the lens was marked in what it's going to give me, not what it would give me if it was on a 35 millimeter camera. Does that help answer the question? I'm still slightly confused. I'm, I'm going to have to look into this. I'm going to have to read up on it a little bit more. It, it's really confusing. Uh, Stuart, um, you might, uh, if, to, to make things equal, um, most of the manufacturers will have the millimeter marking, uh, the actual uh, optical millimeter marking. And that's what's confusing to all of us because 16 millimeters, let's say 16 millimeters because you said it, um, 16 millimeters is not very wide on Paul's camera at all. Um, and 16 millimeters is very wide on a Sony A7. Um, so it's not the millimeters that uh, you want to, to sieve out. It's the angle of view. It's the angle of view. So if you look at any marketing material or, or shopping material, try and get the idea of what is that lens going to do in the angle of view for your body. So there, there, there are different bodies. Uh, like Paul has said, micro four thirds is uh, two times. Um, and so, and, and, uh, uh, the Sony A6500 and the Fuji and all that, they are 1.5, 1.6 times. And the Sony A7, the five, Canon 5D, they are full frame because uh, consumers call them full frame. And so it's, it, it's, it, they all have different sensors and 16 millimeters will make different um, 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 uh, photos on each body. So if you want to equalize all of them and have a, a way to compare, try and find out that lens that you're interested in, what is the angle of view on that body? I hope that helps. It yeah, should. thanks. Angle of view, that's the key word I'll be looking for, thanks. I also emphasize go to a shop and try the lenses, because then you'll know. Because <laughs> you'll be able to Yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to, to, to ask that as well. Yeah, just physically go into a shop and I presume that they would lend me a lens and let me put it on my camera and, and look through it, right? Yep, they will. Um, they nearly all will let you put a lens on your camera inside the shop. If you get to know people in the shop, like there's one particular shop I use, I, I won't plug them because this is local guides and they have given me stuff, so I don't want to connect the two. Um, just in transparency, I am a customer. Yes, they've given me stuff, but that's not why I go there. They trust me enough that I can walk out of that shop with a $2,000 lens for a couple of days. So get to know your bricks and mortar shop and they will support you. An online retailer will not support you in that way and they just can't because they don't know who you are. Um, Awadies asked, what is lens flare? So I'm just quickly gonna present again because I've got a sample that I can show, which was in one of the earlier ones. So I'll just show that. I'll just give that a moment to come up. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, Iwadi, in the top right hand corner of that image, you'll start as you or I travel down towards the, the yellow construction equipment, you'll notice that there's some bright shapes in the sky that look a little bit like UFOs. That's lens flare. It's good and bad. If you know it's gonna happen, and you can see it when you're looking through the eyepiece in your camera. It doesn't really matter what kind of camera you've got, you'll see this. If you know it's going to happen, it can actually be quite cool. You can use it to lots of really interesting effects. Um, I know uh, Ananda's an experimentalist like I am. And we, in fact, I think I've, I do. I've got a crappy old fashioned Coke and filter here, which I can't remember what this one does. It's soft focus. It makes anyone look good. Not that um, I think the very young model on that thing would have possibly needed a soft focus lens, but that's okay. The It's good to experiment with light. It's good to play. 
and that's where lens flare can come into it. You can generate some nice creative effects. You can actually cause leading lines to highlight something that you want to see in a photo. But if you're not expecting it, you don't know how to deal with it. Um, you might remember the huge controversy when probably four or five years ago, the iPhone had this, what everybody described as a an absolutely hideous ruby lens flare, where if you were shooting the slightest into the sun or into a bright light, you could see this all these red dots on it. I actually quite liked it. <laughs> But a lot of people thought it was horrible and they were expecting more from a device that they'd spent money on. The reality is you'll get lens flare in nearly every lens, but most of them are protected so well from it that you don't tend to notice. Um, Adrian makes a really good point. Do you want to unmute and talk about that, Adrian? <laughs> uh, sure, I guess. <laughs> uh, I wasn't okay. expecting to speak. Um, I'll just I was put saying that, that, yeah. <laughs> I was just saying that uh, most of the folks that work in the brick and mortar shops, um, they, they're usually like huge enthusiasts on yeah, photography definitely. as well. Um, and I find that speaking to them, they, they are, everybody starts off as a newbie at some point. So they, they totally understand that if you're going to shop and you're not sure about various things, they're, they're really helpful. Um, and usually they can explain things in ways that I can't understand when I, when I read online. It just doesn't make sense to me. I, I have the same problem where I, when I look at the details online, I'm like, I just don't get it at all. Um, but when I speak to the people at the shops, they are just really helpful. And as Paul said, once you try various lenses, it really helps to explain a lot of things. So, Yeah. And do you know that that struggle never really goes away? No. Because <laughs> you're, you're not struggling against your knowledge you're actually struggling against the people in the marketing department who are working for a brand and they're selling a camera, which to all intents and purposes is exactly the same as the other brand and the other brand and the other brand. And their job is to make their brand seem different when it really isn't. So I do keep saying the best camera that you're using is the camera you need. The camera that you enjoy using is the one for you. And I really do mean that because they all have some some features that are a little bit different here and there. Um, the Ollie has some really good creative composition features that don't exist on other cameras because they were smart enough to patent it for a change. So no one else has been able to implement them yet. But all cameras essentially do the same thing. They take light, they put it on a sensor, they give you an image. All lenses essentially do the same thing. They are all the same. And these marketing companies are trying to make you believe that one brand's better than another one, and they're not. And they do that by trying to confuse you. That's why it's really important to play with stuff. Um, there is one thing I would suggest about going into a bricks and mortar store, though. Leave your credit card and your wallet somewhere else. Because one thing that a website can't do to you, well, not very effectively, I guess they can through various gimmicks, but one, they can't really <laughs> upsell you. So if you go in there and say, I yeah. want to buy a 45 millimeter f1.2 lens, you're going to go and find one on a website. You're probably going to look at a few and shop around a little bit. and You're going to buy that one. But if you go into the shop, you might have been planning on buying a consumer grade lens because that's what you need. And the guy in the shop talks you into buying a more expensive professional one, which often isn't actually better. Uh, I did a shootout a number of years ago with the Canon, what's called the Nifty 50, which is literally a $100 plastic 50 millimeter prime lens. Their middle of the range 50 millimeter prime lens and their $4,000 50 millimeter prime lens. And to be honest with you, when I was looking at the shots at the end, unless I knew which lens it was, so if I did a blind test, I really couldn't tell the difference except in the corners. And when do you photograph stuff that's right in the corners of the image and want people to look at it? Don't. <laughs> Even when you're being creative, it's so rare to do that. So it's easy to get upsold if you go to a bricks and mortar shop. So know what you need. Don't get pushed into buying something that you don't need. If you get upsold, make sure you understand why and you understand what the advantage is to you. And if there's no clear advantage, and if you're going to use your camera for the average kinds of things that people take pictures of, which is their family, 
the activities that they go out on, the places that they go and see. You know, any camera is going to do that for you, and they're probably all going to do it well enough. Where you start getting a little bit different in the more expensive stuff, they boot up quicker. They write to the memory cards quicker. That can actually get annoying, by the way. Um, this camera, well, I've actually taken the memory card out of it. This camera to achieve its frame rate. So this is a, a I don't know if you can read that, but it's a 2000 times SD. Um, when they first came out and you needed them for this camera, they were ridiculously expensive. Now you can get these in the supermarket. But when they first came out, this SD card was probably 10 times more in cost than one of the slower ones. But if you're going to buy a camera that can take a frame of 60 frames a second, you may as well buy an SD card that can write it. <laughs> Particularly if you want to do something like 4K video, you need those cards. So the faster cameras do certainly have advantages because the manufacturers want them to have advantages and they want you to, to buy a more expensive one. I'm going to refrain from saying a better one because <laughs> they're not always. <laughs> Um, I think Ananda has a camera that he dearly loves, which I'm going to pick on because it's really funny because its battery sucks so much, he usually gets three shots out of it before it dies. And it's a, a little old camera called Ruby. Do you happen to have Ruby with you, Ananda? Uh, Ruby, yeah. Uh, oh, behind me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's all right. It's all right. The, that's quite old. And, the, and the, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, four years old, maybe. Um, the one that, that has a poorer battery life is the Sony A7. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do a little bit, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, that's life, though, isn't it? It is. Uh, I've, uh, Stuart, I've put two links up in the chat. One's um, uh, interactive slider uh, for Sony, uh, Sony web page, where you can pull... They're silly. They, they didn't make the thing, the slider stick. You have to hold the mouse down and slide it until... It, anyway, it shows you the two formats that Sony has, the, the, the full frame, they call it 35mm, and the APS-C. And then I've also put up uh, an example um, um, angle of view chart that for Paul's camera. Uh, that's, uh, you, you can click on that, you can see the JPEG, and you can see the angle of views... Uh, uh, that that relate to Paul's camera. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. That's all right. So before we break off from those things, um, one of the reasons that I chose the Micro Four Thirds platform, let's not talk about the particular brand I went for, <laughs> but the Micro Four Thirds platform, one of the reasons I like it is because across all of the different brands, that's the same. It's the same lens across those different brands. Uh, so this little Samyang lens, it's a native lens for Micro Four Thirds. It just works. The Panasonic lenses, which I've actually got a couple of, and I have to admit, I, I love their some of their consumer grade stuff. It's um, I hate to say this Olympus, but it's better than some of your pro gear. <laughs> oh, well, they can hate me for that later. Uh, because you've got several manufacturers that make this gear and there's more and more each year you've got a really good selection to choose from and there's a lot of natural competition but it also means there's a really strong second hand market for this gear and you can buy at fairly reasonable prices really good stuff are there any more questions tonight hello paul hi Akshat. Yeah, I have two questions. So my first question is, uh, what type of lens should we use to take a uh, st uh, star trail shot? And my second question is, uh, can a high-end smartphone take a star trail shot? I'll go with the first one first. And the answer is any lens you want <laughs> can do star trails. But if you want a big, nice circle, um, you probably want a fairly wide lens. So the, the wider you can do, the better. Um, one thing that can be important with star trails is how bright the lens is. So what size aperture hole you can get, mainly so you can focus because it's dark. It doesn't matter so much afterwards, particularly if you're deliberately getting trails. Um, I don't know if you all understand what we're talking about, but the Earth moves and it is a ball. 
So no matter where you are in the world, if you do a long exposure shot at night where some of the sky's there, you'll actually see trails where the stars have moved. I'll try and put a shot in for next week. I'm not going to go struggling through my Lightroom now trying to find you one, but um, I'll, I'll try and remember one for next week. So nice and wide, nice and bright to focus, even if you step down a bit after that. You can do some really cool stuff with star trails. One of the things I suggest you do is get a, a torch or a flashlight, depending on what you call it. Put a building or a tree or something like that in the shot. Make sure it's a nice dark, dark place. You won't get good star trails in a city because you won't be able to see them. But once you've got that building in shot and you're doing maybe, I don't know, 5, 20, 30 minute exposure for your trails, paint the building with the torch. And you'll see this building start to appear in your image. It's, it's just kind of cool. It's hard to get it right, and you'll take a few minutes at it, but it's fun. Now, the second image, can a smartphone do a star trail shot? I think you'd struggle, to be honest, because smartphones tend not to have really long exposure times. So I think the best I've seen is only a few seconds on a phone you might also struggle even if you can find one that does have a longer exposure time than that and if there is one great um, but you might struggle to hold it still enough because they don't have a tripod mount on the phone you, you can get something that clutches the phone and put that onto a tripod you can definitely do that but i think you'd be challenged with such a small lens to get a decent star trail and i think you'd be challenged to find one that does a decent long exposure I know that there are some, I think the iPhone current one actually yeah. claims to do long exposures. Um, it doesn't really. It actually takes several shots and burns them. So I'm not sure if you would end up with trails from that or not. We'd have to do some experimentation on that. I don't own one, so I'm not really sure on that. But um, if that's what you've got, give it a try and see what you can do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Cool. Are there any other questions tonight? Lots of you are very quiet this week. Doesn't look like there's not much else in the chat here. Um, thanks for the link on Star Trails, Ananda. I could always present that. <laughs> Actually, I probably shouldn't because I don't know the copyright on their website and I'd be putting it in my video. That's a bit, a bit uh, risky. <laughs> So our two tasks, and you can blend them into one task if you want to, but you might like to keep them separate just for simplicity. We're going to take find somewhere that's got some kind of leading lines away from you towards something. doesn't matter what for this purpose, but just towards something. And three shots at three different zoom ranges for whatever your camera or phone in, can do. And the other one is getting as close to something as you can and keep it in focus. So it's important to try and keep it in focus. Hopefully we won't get any really <laughs> strange fuzzy ones. Um, sharp images are really nice unless you're trying to be creative and have a deliberately unsharp image. So unsharp is a funny word, but if you search for the hashtag unsharp on Instagram or Facebook or whatever socials you happen to like, you will find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people sharing deliberately unfocused images. And they don't just mean they turned focus off and went click. They mean that they actually used it creatively to, to have some kind of change in the scene. So are there any other questions tonight? Or shall we do what we usually do and scream out local guides if you all unmute? Uh, quick question. Did somebody mention the spreadsheets at the beginning of the session where, where links or something are, are, are stored or catalogued? I have a problem following the chat. Uh, the chat can be a little bit difficult, yes. Uh, I do put the links into the post on Connect, but I don't share the links to the album and the feedback form um, in that post because I would get people who didn't come to it putting things in there. So once I, I, I actually I should take that back, I do eventually share the link to the album, um, but I turn off contributions before I do that because I don't want other people to start putting their things in there. Uh, I can, I'm not sure if I've got your ID actually, Stuart, if you, if you pop your connect ID into the chat, if you can do that, if you can't do that, um, send me a DM on Instagram, perhaps at drop bear Paul. Okay. So I'll just stick that in the, 
because this really doesn't help you very much because I'm putting it in the chat. But um, <laughs> if you send if you send me a DM on Insta, so it's and Google's being helpful in the background there. Uh, if you send me that drop bear Paul, I will get those links out to you that way. Hey Paul, good evening, Anil here. Hi, Anil. See, inside the cupboard, I can see some Legos are captured and arrested. Uh, there are a lot of Legos in there, yes. <laughs> There's a lot here too. You want a rabbit? <laughs> that's it, that's it. I was looking for what is your latest creation? Wow. Great, <laughs> great. You know what that is? Actually, the latest one I built wasn't Baby Yoda. The latest one I built was that. It's a, one of the Star Wars machines. How about any robotics now near me or autonomics or mechanical something? But mechanical engineering, last time there were machine which we made. I have built trains. Um, I have recently promised the Lego convention that's on in January next year that I'm going to join in a great ball contraption. So I have to build one for that. Engine locomotive? What about that locomotive, diesel locomotive? Um, I have built a, a couple, yes. Perhaps one I day should, you but... would like to have a journey of all the museum, you know? All <laughs> museum. Yeah, perhaps I should do a Lego meetup. <laughs> one meetup, one dedicated for them exclusively. Yeah, we could probably do that. We could do something around trains and Lego if you want to. Cool. Oh, well, if everybody would like to unmute, please. Hi, Paul. Hi, Anshu. Uh, um, I had oh, a question, sure. actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, go. I know, uh, like, actually, when uh, when you go out for me, carrying one camera itself is a very big thing. So will you select uh, the lenses uh, according to the place you visit, or you carry all the lenses with you? Ananda's going to laugh at me now. <laughs> um, it varies. So I've been known to turn up on a photo walk with a few people with a backpack and 20 kilos of camera gear in it. Um, I don't do that anymore well, because I'm getting old and fat. <laughs> one, one day we were uh, standing outside uh, an entrance and Paul says uh, he needed to go to the toilet. So he says, can you hold my bag? I says, yeah, it's not a problem. <laughs> and then I almost dropped this bag because it was so heavy. He had about four lenses, the body, all the batteries, everything. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, these days I'm a little bit more selective. So when I, if I'm traveling a long way from home, I will take two bodies and I take two lenses that aren't the same but similar. So the 12 to 100 will come and probably the, the 12 to 42 is the other one I'll take. So the reason I take two is if I break one, if I lose one, if I get mugged, I've still got a camera and it uses the same cards and the same lenses. So I can still use it. It's reasonably familiar. So I've got this one. I can't afford two of these because it is kind of expensive. And if I bought another one of these, my wife would want a new car. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I have a, a much cheaper one that's much, it's in the same manufacturer, but it's much, much lower in the range. It's actually their entry level camera, which is pretty good, I have to admit. But I prefer this one because it's a bit chunkier and a bit easier for me to handle. It fits my hands well. Uh, but I do take those. When I'm going out a photo walk these days, I tend to take one camera and one lens. And okay. I might take a lens that's going to be useful for the day in which case i'll take that 12 to 100 okay. or i might take a lens because i want to challenge myself so i might go on a photo walk and take a macro lens and only shoot with a macro lens or oh. or i might go out on a photo walk and take an, a 1970s 400 millimeter lens that is literally this big <laughs> that, yes. that's too big for my camera hang on there we go take one that <laughs> bigger than that um, just because i want to see what i can do with that lens and I want to challenge myself a bit. Sometimes I regret doing that and sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's fun. Because travel itself will be somewhat tedious and carrying again will be a burden on us. Because almost all, 
on the thing i has uh, uh, you tell that battery everything will be heavy yep mm. yeah indeed and if you're taking two camera bodies chances are they don't use the same batteries unless it's the exact yes. same one so you've got to take double the batteries i do i do tend to make sure i've got at least two charged batteries with me so i've got the one that's in the camera and one more if i'm going for a long time i'll take two more because what the one thing about mirrorless cameras that the manufacturers probably don't want you to know about is they eat the batteries really quickly. I mean, yeah. even the good, even the good ones will go through a battery fairly quick, because they're driving that display full time and they're just driving driving that display very fast and they're driving their computer processor really fast all the time. Whereas the DSLRs, because they're half optical, half digital, they've got a luxury is that they can turn the digital side off more or less, or at least slow it down so they don't use as much power. Now, there, there's some exceptions to that. There's, um, oh, which one is it? Kelvin's camera, <laughs> Pentax. The, the, oh. the, the biggest of the Pentax cameras, amazing battery life. I don't know how they do it. It's like they've got a little power station in there. <laughs> but it does have an amazing battery life for a, for a mirrorless camera. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Are there any other questions? But one way these all carrying cameras and all will be helping you for reducing your time in gym. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, but um, when you are traveling, the more you carry, the harder it is. And even if you're only doing a photo walk for, you know, a, a few hours, you could carry anything. You could carry a 10 kilo camera and you wouldn't care. But if you're going to go out for a whole day, or longer, you don't want that much weight. Not once you start getting older. The younger people, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Because age also matters, right? Yeah, it does. Younger people are stronger. They, yeah. they have uh, more stamina and more resilience usually. I'm sorry, I'm going here. She goes, I'm the youngest one here. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I totally differ over here. Um, I have different of opinion, Paul. The more you grow old, the more you become young, especially in the field of photography. The kind of vintage of experience, the kind of mistakes you have done, the wisdom of collection of so many mistakes makes you more young and refreshing. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think that's true. Um, you never stop learning about anything in photography is not unique you'll learn something every time you pick your camera up. And it might be something that you knew before, but you'd forgotten, or it might be something genuinely new that you've actually never learned before. And that happens for me, particularly if I get a new lens or something like that, I'll start to see something different again. And that might take me back to my other lenses and go, hey, wow, do I see that in those ones? Um, one of the really interesting things is mostly on my camera, I don't see sensor dirt. It's certainly there but you just don't see it because of the way the system works. But when you put something like this on, which is that little one, <coughs> excuse me, which is the pinhole lens, because it's such a small hole for the light to come through and the camera, it's wrong to put it this way, but the camera is working really hard. Um, you see every spot of dirt on your sensor. <laughs> and it makes you think, can I see those spots in the other photos? And if you zoom in far enough, you will. But most of the time, you don't notice that they're there. Excuse me, I should have brought some more water to this thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about coughing in your ear. Drink some water. <laughs> I haven't got any left. It's empty. Um, the Yulia asked, I choose a small camera with zoom for travels because it's light and takes little place in hang luggage. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, one thing I do encourage people is keep your camera in your hand luggage, whether you're on a train or you're going on a plane or whatever, um, keep it in the luggage that's with you. It doesn't matter if your camera is a cheap one or an expensive one, it is desirable to someone who'd like to steal it. It's very vulnerable to being hit or dropped. So keep it with you so that you're in charge of it and you can look after it. Okay, so it brings us to the time of the evening where we're going to say goodbye. But first, if you're all unmute and we can do the local guides yelling out again. So we're all ready to go.
Local guy. All right. See you later, everybody. Thank you again for coming along. And we will see you next week, I hope. And we're going to be talking next week about uh, ISO and a little bit more aperture. And we'll start getting into shutter speed as well. Cool. See you next week. Thank you. Bye, Paul. Bye, Bye guys. Thank you.